2,000 years ago, the Apostle John had a vision about a beast that would rise, a mark that would be given. Four horses will gallop through time, and Christianity will stand on the brink of collapse. But there is hope. Revelation. Well, hello and welcome. I'm so glad you could join us as we continue to study Bible prophecy together. If you have not done it yet, please be sure to go to BeholdTheSavior.com. You can find the notes for tonight's presentation. You can also find uh, archived videos of the series leading up to this point. There has been a number of presentations before this one. And if you've missed one, be sure to go there and, and catch up. But I'm um, so glad you could join us here uh, this evening. If you have some Bible question, uh, you can leave that right here in the comments below. And uh, we have people standing by that are ready right now to answer those Bible questions for you. And uh, if you'd like, you can also go to BeholdTheSavior.com. You can leave your Bible question there as well. Well, tonight we're going to look at how to postpone your funeral. You know, Mary Winkler was walking along a beach in uh, Amram Island, a German island near the border of Denmark, when she found something fascinating. It was an old bottle that appeared to contain a message. And she wasn't able to open it, so they took a picture of it and then smashed it, and what they found was something very interesting. It was uh, something from the Marine Biological Society in London. And uh, when she contacted them, they had no idea what it was about. And then after a little bit of research, they had found that uh, years before, uh, several hundred of them, in fact, 110 years before, in fact, several hundred of them had been put into the ocean for somebody that could study the ocean currents. And she literally found a message in a bottle. Well, we don't have to look for some bottle to find God's message to us in this evening. All we have to do is open the Bible and we can find God's message right there. And uh, I want to encourage you, you crack open your Bible, you can follow right along, or we'll have the uh, verses on the screen for you as well. Right there in the three angels' message in Revelation chapter 14, we find the call, says, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Well, how do you give glory to God? We want to find our answers in the book of Daniel. Daniel and Revelation are sister books. And you know, Daniel tells us the stories of how to live in the last days. Revelation tells us the prophecies of the last days. At 83 years old, Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. A law was passed that uh, he was not allowed to worship the God who and how he was used to worshiping. And of course, he didn't let that stop him. He went up in the upper room windows open and he worshiped God. Well, he got into a little bit of trouble. He was arrested. He was thrown into the lion's den at 83 years old. Oftentimes people forget um, or don't draw attention to his age at that point. And he stood fast. He worshiped God and uh, he was thrown into the lion's den as a result. But you know the end of the story. He survived the lion's den, right? God sent angels to protect him, to close the mouths of the lion. How did he survive the lion's den spiritually? Daniel was a man of prayer. He did not lead a life of prayer and consecration to God. I mean, he didn't wait to do that till the lion's den. He led a life of prayer and consecration to God, which prepared him for the lion's den. That's how he was able to survive that spiritually. How was he able to survive it physically? At that age, how, he, how could he survive such a task, such a feat, and we find that it has to do with his um, lifestyle. When Daniel and his friends were taken out of Babylon, out of Jerusalem into Babylonian captivity, he and his friends were tested. They were tested for asking. He asked for the test for ten days. See, they wanted to put him on the king's diet, which would have been an honor to be placed at the eat from the king's table. But unfortunately, there were some things that were not quite as healthy. 
uh, for Daniel, and there were some food that was dedicated to other gods, and he wanted to be placed on a diet, he and his friends, of just uh, pulse, the Bible says, which is basically a very strict uh, vegetarian diet. Uh, water and pulse and grains and that sort of thing. And he and this this and he was found to be wisest of the wise. The Bible says they were fairer and fatter than the rest. What did Daniel know that we don't know today? Well, how can we give glory to God with our bodies? Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. This was God's call to his people as they left Egyptian bondage. They went through the ten plagues, Red Sea. And uh, what, what are some of the things that the Egyptians were, were dealing with with their health at that time? Well, scientists have done their research, and it, look here, it's really interesting what the ancient Egyptians suffered from. Um, atherosclerosis, heart disease, obesity, cancer, tooth decay, even stress. We think these are all sort of new modern things that we deal with. We, people have been, we humans have been dealing with these things uh, for a long time. But um, God said, if you heed my word, obey my commandments, these things that the Egyptians dealt with won't happen to you. Well, 3 John, verse 2. The, John wrote several books in the Bible. He wrote, of course, the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They were letters. And he also wrote the Revelation of Jesus Christ. In the little book, 3rd John, it's right back there by Revelation. In fact, if you flip real quick, you go right past it. There's only one chapter. So we're looking at 3 John verse 2. He says this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, above all things, what does God want for us? He wants us to have good health, be in good health, so we can live longer, so we can serve longer, so we can be happier, healthier longer. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Did you know, biblically speaking, the Bible says you are a temple of God. Well, how are we a temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit dwells inside us. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We want to take good care of our temple, don't we? If you were to pull up to church, you know, your favorite church, maybe one you grow up or one you go to now, I don't know. If you were to pull up to church and you saw graffiti all over the outside of your church and uh, somebody, somebody smashed the windows through, they shoved steel rods through the windows and maybe even they lit a fire in the sanctuary, smoke's billowing out of the sanctuary, how would that make you feel if you showed up to church like that? My guess is you probably wouldn't be too happy. But it's just some building of brick and mortar. And we get upset about that. But don't we do those very same things to our own body? Which temple do you think God holds in higher regard? It's us. It's you. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 tells us of the fruit of the Spirit. You know that God is living in your heart, or you can tell when one has God in their heart because they have this outward evidence. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, what is self-control? Other Bible translations say temperance. What is temperance? It is totally avoiding things that are harmful and using in moderation things that are good for you. Do you know the Bible gives us some pretty specific principles regarding our lifestyle and health? And uh, did you know you can actually eat too many carrots? You can eat so many carrots, your skin can actually turn orange from it. You can even drink too much water. That's kind of hard to believe. You can drink so much water, you push the sodium right out of your cells. You can literally drown your body at a cellular level. I mean, you would have to drink copious, copious amounts of it and eat a lot of carrots. But even a good thing can be overdone. So temperance is totally avoiding things that are harmful and using in moderation things that are good. 
Does the Bible give specific principles on how to maintain our temple? Well, we're going to take a look at a few of these um, very specific principles. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, whoever is led astray by it is not wise. I used to work in an office and I processed um, service claims for furniture industry and and um, I would put Bible verses on my computer. So when I walk away, you know, Bible verse pops up and the computer's doing work when I can't. <laughs> and I had, there was somebody in the office that day that had, um, had, a, had a wild night the night before. And he was dealing with the results of it the next day. Headache and, and all. And I was told by a co-worker of mine, he was talking to him and he said, you know, every time I looked over at that, Brandon's uh, screen, I just regretted last night's decisions. You know, God gives us good principles because he wants us to be happy and healthy. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Did you know the number one cause of mental retardation is fetal alcohol syndrome? It's sad that a number one cause of mental retardation could have been avoided. How many car accidents could have been avoided had alcohol not been in the picture? How many battered wives, broken homes could have been avoided had alcohol not been in the picture? How many people sitting behind bars wouldn't be there had alcohol not been in the picture? How many relationships have been broken because the alcohol, it lowers our inhibitions. We do things that we would not normally do how many relationships and marriages would have been spared had alcohol not been in the picture? And I guess the question is, should a Christian drink alcohol? And, uh, well, let's, let's look at it here. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So you tell me right off the bat, biblically speaking, is it wise to or not to drink? The Bible says it's wise not to. Well, 1 Timothy 5.23, I know what you're thinking because uh, I used to use some of these arguments as well, some of these um, challenging verses, but wait a second. I thought the Bible said it was okay to drink, maybe even just a little. 1 Timothy 5.23, this is the Apostle Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. See, Paul says to use a little bit of wine. It's okay, a little bit of wine. Well, in Hebrew, uh, the Old Testament, uh, wine is pulled from a few different words. One is the word tyrosh, it means unfermented wine, and yayin means fermented wine. Two words in the Hebrew has been translated into one word in English, wine. So you can't tell if it's talking about fermented or unfermented unless you use reason and keep it into context. In the Greek, which is what the New Testament is written in, there's one word, oinos, which means fermented or unfermented. So we want to use some good, sound principles there. So was Timothy, was Paul telling Timothy to drink wine? Well, we know that now that alcohol leads to stomach problems and ulcers and all sorts of things, but did you know that grape juice actually has some soothing properties um, connected with, uh, with the stomach. It actually alleviates some stomach problems. So is, is Paul telling Timothy to drink alcohol or to drink grape juice, unfermented wine? Isaiah chapter 65 verse 8 says, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it for a blessing is in it. You'll find the difference between old wine and new wine. New wine, of course, is grape juice. Old wine is the putrefied, fermented, um, al alcoholic wine. But I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, didn't Jesus turn water into wine? Well, let's take a look at it. Um, really, you have to ask the question, was Jesus a bartender? I mean, can you imagine Jesus at the party passing out the beer and the smokes? Or is it possible that Jesus turned the water into grape juice. You know, uh, uh, wine, uh, the celebrations in those days, the wedding celebrations would last days. And uh, by that point, you know, you can't even tell what you're drinking. You've been so numbed by what, uh, whatever alcohol you're drinking. But uh, the master of the feast says uh, that he compliments the quality of the wine. 
and uh, most people save the uh, do the best first and then the worst is last but you've saved the best for last so he's he's imagine water that had been turned into grape juice this would be the purest grape juice anybody would have ever had straight from the hand of the creator this would have been some pretty impressive grape juice so was jesus a bartender i don't think so john chapter 2 verse 10 and he said to him every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now uh, that word wine there grape juice unfermented wine Really, if we accuse Jesus of giving alcohol to his friends, we would actually have to accuse him of sinning. Why? Because in the Habakkuk, it's a book in the Old Testament, one that's not gotten into a lot, it says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. The Bible says that uh, giving alcohol to other people is a sin. Jesus certainly did not sin. He could not have been the spotless lamb of God force. He could not have been that sacrifice. What about wine at the Last Supper? Surely that's alcoholic. Um, I've been to many churches throughout my life. I've been to churches that have used um, alcoholic wine and uh, non-alcoholic. Well, what would Jesus have used? And um, well, let's take a look at Mr. Welch. Our, our, our example can be found there you know, of all places. And uh, in 1869, Welch invented a method of pasteurizing grape juice so that the fermentation was stopped. 25 years earlier, the Wesleyan Methodist Connection required unfermented wine at the Lord's Supper, proving that there were other methods available at the time. I ha I've had pastors challenge me on this, but certainly at that time, there was no such thing as unfermented grape juice. They didn't have ways to preserve it. Actually, they did. We now know that there are containers with wax rings and it could have been preserved. Absolutely, they could have had non-alcoholic wine. Welch was noticing that uh, people at communion were getting a little bit tipsy by the end of the day. The priests were, you know, giving communion so much they had started to affect them. So he invented, that's where Welch's grape juice come from, uh, comes from. And it was to be able to provide non-alcoholic preserved grape juice for the communion service. Matthew 26, 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the of this fruit of the vine. Notice it's the fruit of the vine, fresh off the cluster. From now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. There's not gonna be alcohol in heaven. And uh, even you find wine associated with the teachings of the Bible. Jesus' teaching is pure wine, and uh, the false teachings as alcoholic wine. You can see that clearly in the Bible. What about at the cross? When Jesus was dying on the cross, even then he refused to take the drink. You see, they were, uh, he was hanging on the cross, and, and they uh, held this uh, sponge up to him, would have been um, full of alcohol, would have been as a painkiller, and, you know, don't think they were being considerate. No, they wanted to dull the pain so they could abuse him longer. But when he tasted, once he tasted that it was alcohol, he turned away and refused it. Why? because there are repercussions to alcohol. It clouds our thinking. And Jesus on the cross, at that point, of all others, he did not want anything inhibiting the communication between him and the Father. That's what alcohol does. It beclouds the mind, leads us to make decisions we would not normally make. It makes good sense why the devil would use this as a weapon to try to cloud our communication with God. What are the repercussions of alcohol? Well, Noah experimented with the new drug and exposed himself to his sons. Lot had incestuous relations with his daughters. Children of Israel danced naked, worshiped an idol, and all that ended in a horrible massacre. David's son raped his half-sister. Job lost everything, starting with a drinking party. How could a Christian argue in defense of alcohol it doesn't make things better, it makes things worse. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29, we see even some, some specific descriptions of when to go after and when to not go after the wine. Well, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Ever see a bar fight? Who has redness of eyes? 
those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around. It tells us when not to go after it. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. And uh, we want the grape juice, not the alcoholic wine. Proverbs 23, 33. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Ever hear of beer goggles? You know, you meet someone at the bar and someone not that attractive. Well, you get a couple drinks in you, all of a sudden that person doesn't seem so ugly. <laughs> it, it makes us do things that we normally wouldn't do. Well, what else damages the frontal lobe? The frontal lobe, that's where our decision-making is. The devil wants to attack our, our decision-making, our good moral reasoning. He wants to dull that, and, and certainly alcohol numbs that down. But what else is there that does that? Another thing that damages the frontal lobe is nicotine. An enormous percentage of deaths in the United States every year are responsible or associated with nicotine. Um, in fact, in any part of the Western world, uh, are, are caused by this by this nicotine by inhaling it um, in, in all of its forms. And you know, now there's been this big push these last few years to go to the um, to the electronic cigarettes, the vaping, and um, there's plenty of problems with that. It's unregulated nicotine, and actually going that route, you're going to get you can potentially get far more nicotine and other problems. And you know, what goes hand in hand often with that is caffeine. It's the most widely used and available drug that anybody can get. You could send your, your five-year-old child down to the store to get this drug, but um, you know, it's, it's not neutral, it's harmful because it disrupts the chemistry of the brain and it, um, it tangles with the neurotransmitters that keep your brain balanced. Caffeine is the world's most widely used mind-altering drug. What we found, according to Dr. James Lane at Duke University, is that caffeine interacts with stress and intensifies it. Oftentimes people, uh, when they drink caffeine, it demands a stronger stimulant, so the coffee and the cigarettes go hand in hand. And, and oftentimes, both may need to be stopped to find real freedom. And it's the, caffeine is the drug choice of, for 9 out of 10 Americans. You know, we have teenagers dying today from ingesting these high-energy drinks. And certainly, if we want to glorify God, um, would, would we want to step away from that? Well, what was man's original design, diet? Did, did God's original plan for our diet in the Garden of Eden include those things? Well, probably not, but what did it include? Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. God's original diet in the Garden of Eden, believe it or not, was a vegetarian diet. Actually, it was a fruititarian diet. They ate fruit, nuts, and grains. And I, that's, that's why I like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. This is a perfect Edenic diet. Fruit, nuts, and grains. Vegetables didn't even come into play until after sin. God had everything they need. You know, everything was fast food in the Garden of Eden. You walk up to a tree, you pick the fruit, eat it, and go. You didn't have this laboring and digging and, and cooking the food. I mean, I guess you could if you wanted to, but then sin comes, everything changes, everything changes. Now, you can't get the nutrients you did before, so you have to dig for the food and eat plants, and, um, and, and that's the change. You know, sin affects everything. Genesis 3.18, Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. You know, God's people in the Garden of Eden, were they were all vegetarians. In fact, that happened for quite some time. And that makes good sense. I mean, can you imagine Adam and Eve naming all those wonderful animals, you know, going after naming Fluffy the lamb and, and, and Bouncy the kangaroo, and then chasing down a cow with a meat cleaver to have that for supper? No, that's, that's not what took place. So when did this happen? When did meat eating come into play? Well, it happened 
um, at, uh, at the great flood, the ark. Now, let me ask you this. How many of each animal did God take into the ark? If you said two, you were absolutely wrong. Well, you're partially right. Genesis chapter 16, verse 19 says, And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. And then just a couple verses down, it expands on that. You shall take with you seven of every clean animal, male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. So how do I determine what's clean and unclean? Well, you, you could not offer as, as a sacrifice an unclean animal. Um, it had to be considered biblically clean. You know, and as Noah and his family were on the boat, you know, and they got off the ark, everything was destroyed, all the vegetation, not a whole lot of salad bars open at that time. So God had to make provision for them. Meat eating was actually the backup plan for it. And unfortunately, they did it at a great cost. You track the average lifespan before the um, flood, eight, nine hundred years the average person lived. And after that, you can track it nicely. Just read through the Bible after the flood account, and the, the average lifespan drops dramatically. They began to eat the meat, but it was at a great cost. But anyway, how do we determine what's considered clean and what's unclean? Is it a sin to eat meat? No, Bible says it's not. Um, but uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 3 says, Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. So con to be considered a biblically clean animal has to have two things um, in place has to, for the land animals, has to chew the cud and have a split hoof. So what kind of animals do you think of that, that have that today? A cow, a deer, elk, you know, a lot of the animals we eat in the United States are considered biblically clean. Um, but how about pig? Um, no, doesn't, uh, doesn't fit the description. It says, And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean for you. God tells us, listen, if you want to be healthy as you can, this is one thing that you'll want to avoid. And largely because they have something called the trichini worm, the trichinosis worm. And, you know, if you've ever been to a hospital or visited somebody there with heart problems, typically one of the first things they take off their diet um, is pork. And it has high salt content, and uh, they're known for having what's called this trichinosis worm. And um, uh, you can... I, I was doing a Bible study with a gentleman one time, and he lived through the Great Depression. Um, and he was telling me at this point in our study, he said, boy, you know, let, let me tell you how we used to prepare the, the pork. We, and you know, at that time, if you were lucky enough to get a pork, you wanted to take uh, good care of it. So they would take it, they, they would put it out on a hot tin roof for a little while. I said, why would you put it out on a hot tin roof for a while? He said, because the heat from the roof and the sun would force the trichinosis worms to crawl up out of the meat and then we'd pick them off, scrape it off, and then we'd cook the pork and eat it. These trichinosis worms um, have their... It, it, trichinosis, um, it masks itself as many other maladies. It's kind of hard to nail it down. And many people that uh, wonder if they have um, arthritis just may have trichinosis worms living in your joints. And it's a, it can be a real problem. Did you know, actually, there's no such thing as grade A pork? You can get grade A beef, but you cannot get grade A pork because evidently they're allowed to sell it with so many trichinosis worms per square inch. Now, it's no wonder that God says, listen, if you want to be happy and healthy or longer, you don't want to avoid that. How about the sea creatures? Leviticus chapter 11, verse 9. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. So according to the Bible, what, um, what does a sea creature have to have to be considered biblically clean? Have to have fins and scales. But all that is in the seas or rivers that does not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. So what can you think of that has fins and scales? Uh, trout considered biblically clean. Now, I was never big on seafood, so I can't really name too many, but uh, trout, tuna, 
Um, you know, a lot of those things. How about catfish? Uh, well, they have fins, but they don't have scales. And that's why they can grow to these large sizes because they're at the bottom. They're bottom feeders. They're eating at the bottom. They're eating what all the other fish already ate. Um, how about shrimp? Uh, lobster? No, uh, you know the best place to find those sorts of animals? Right at the sewage outlets at the water. Why? <laughs> because they're eating what you already ate. And that's why God placed them on this earth. These animals were placed here um, because they're, they're, they clean uh, the earth. They purify the water and they have a very good purpose, but that doesn't mean God put them there for us to eat. How about the birds? And these you shall regard as an abomination among you. The birds, they shall not be eaten. They are an abomination, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard. And, uh, you know, during in this list, the Bible does not really give a specific has to have this or this, but you can tell by the list that's given what they have in common. And you don't want to eat birds of carrion. Basically, if you see a bird eating something that's already dead, stay away from it. But, you know, birds like turkey, I'm not taking away your Thanksgiving turkey. Turkey, grouse, pheasant, quail, uh, even pigeon, believe it or not, are all considered biblically clean. But one thing that isn't is uh, the bat. You know, with the coronavirus, it has been traced to um, one of the one of the prevalent theories is it may have been traced to people eating bats that were for sale at a wet market. Makes you wonder if if God's people had been faithful even in diet, could it have prevented a worldwide pandemic? If and that's why God said that when we follow Him, these things that struck the Egyptians when we're obediently following him, even on our health, wouldn't attack us. But see, when we, you know, when we do what God said we shouldn't do, we have problems. That's why he tells us not to do them, because he loves us. How about insects? Leviticus chapter 11, verse 21. Yet ye as you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet, with which to leap on the earth. Basically, anything of the grasshopper family, the locust family. These you may eat the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. I was uh, visiting with a lady one time. We were studying the Bible with somebody else, and we got to this point in the Bible uh, study, and she had never seen this before. The lady that was with me, we were <laughs> studying with the other lady, and she said, huh, I didn't know you could eat that. So she went home that night, she looked up how to prepare grasshoppers and figured out how to cook them in butter and told me about it the next day. And I said, maybe you misunderstood me. I said, you can eat that. You don't have to eat that. So I guess if you're in a pinch, you can eat those things. You know, I'm kind of praying that God sends something else. But if you want to or need to, those are considered biblically clean within those parameters. Um, let's talk about the second coming, but I thought all of these things, these health laws were done away with at the cross, weren't they? Did Jesus died on the cross, so these, these don't matter anymore, right? Well, let's look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15. This says, we're traveling in time to the second coming. It says, Behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So this is the second, this is beyond the cross, right, in time, all the way to the second coming. It says, those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go into the gardens after an idol in the midst. Now notice what they're eating. Swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. When Jesus comes back, there's going to be two groups of people. There's going to be one that says, God, whatever you say, I'll do it. And then there's going to be the other group of people that says, yes, I know you said this, but. Or I know you said don't do this, but. And those people are associating this. It says they sanctify themselves. You want to be sanctified by God. You want him to set you apart by holy use, for holy use. We don't want to sanctify ourselves. We don't want to do it on our own merits and do things our own way. They're the ones that are hiding when Jesus comes back. And their, one of the identifying marks, believe it or not, is by their diet. Will God's, God's, God's one, of his, one of his identifying marks is, will my people obey me even when it comes to their dinner plate? It's a good question. 
Well, let's let's talk about Peter's dream a little bit, shall we? I know what you're thinking. Because I used the same arguments when I started to hear these things, too. And um, But Peter had a dream that says, now we can eat whatever we want to, right? Well, let's look at the dream. Uh, Peter was in vision. He was on the rooftop, and uh, uh, he had this vision of a sheet that came down with all kinds of... Um, unclean animals on it. Let's read it, Acts 10, 11. And saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. See, they stop right there and say, see that, Peter? Jesus told, God told Peter, eat whatever he want. But we, we want to continue with the rest of it. You can't stop right in the middle of it. Peter says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Wait a second. Peter, who walked and talked with Jesus for three and a half years, are you telling me during that time Jesus never once told him that, what was unclean before the cross will eventually be clean after. Did Jesus die on the cross and that molecularly changed the unclean animals and made them clean all of the sudden? And did it? Yeah, of course not. But didn't Jesus say that all foods are clean now? Mark chapter 7 verse 19. For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. The New King James, New International Version says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And that becomes a problem because we don't find that in the original version. Let's read it again, the New International Version. For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Look at the King James Version. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out in the drought, purging all meats. That is completely different, isn't it? What it's talking about is what comes out of the mouth makes a person unclean. You know, in other words, what comes out of your mouth reveals what is in your heart. It had nothing to do with diet. Jesus was using that as an example to teach people about controlling their mouth and having a relationship with him. Acts chapter 10, verse 15. So we already know Jesus, when he was on earth, he never made any change. And Peter never heard any change. So look at this, a voice uh, spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This happened three times, didn't it? How many times did Peter deny Jesus? That happened three times, didn't it? Peter had this um, problem with a way of thinking. He was kind of stubborn. Can you ever relate with, with Peter? He didn't understand what this vision meant. We know that because he says so. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent. So here we have something interesting. He's in vision. He is, he's getting this vision that he doesn't understand, unclean animals in the sheet, and then all of a sudden, knock, knock, knock. There's a knock on the door. Hey, we want you, uh, Cornelius sent us to come get you, to come back and preach the gospel to us. Well, that's interesting timing, isn't it? But you see, to Peter, the Gentiles were considered unclean. The Jews were God's chosen people. You don't mess with the Gentiles because they're just like dogs, you know. Um, Acts chapter 10, verse 28, then he said to them, you know how it is unlawful, uh, it, how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Um, that's very interesting. Um, Peter was going to refuse bringing the gospel to them because in his mind and in his tradition, they were unclean. God was using something Peter could relate to, the health laws, the dietary health laws. He knew the distinction between clean and unclean meats. And now he says, oh, I get it. God was telling me I shouldn't call any man common or unclean. The vision had nothing to do with diet, had everything to do with taking the gospel to anybody and everybody. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. I know that whatever God does, 
it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing taken away. Does God change his mind? Would you want to worship a God that changes his mind? He doesn't change his mind. And certainly he didn't die on the cross to, uh, to make us able to eat whatever we want. That, that was not the goal of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. This is one of the first Bible verses I ever memorized. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Can you smoke crack to the glory of God? Probably not. Can you shoot heroin to the glory of God? Probably not. Can you smoke cigarettes to the glory of God? Probably not. Can you drink caffeine to the glory of God? Probably not. Can you eat unclean food to the glory of God, unclean meat? Probably not. Can you drink alcohol to the glory of God? Probably not. But you can glorify Him in so many other ways and eating the good things that He's prepared for us to help have us have a help, happier, healthier life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable thing that God asks us. It's not unreasonable. You know, I've been to a lot of bedsides of people in the hospital. I've been to a lot of funerals, a lot of lives that were taken needlessly, and God doesn't want the devil to have any more victories. If there's something you can do in your life and change it, then change it. If there's something you're doing that's harming your body, take this opportunity and change it. I'm reminded of what happened a few years ago now in a slot canyon in Utah. A young man named Aaron Ralston was out hiking. No one knew where he was. He was hiking alone when a boulder dislodged and pinned him. Now, you can't just push a boulder off. All he had was a doll pocket knife. It was a matter of life and death because no one was ever going to find him, so he went to work. And when he came back, he was one arm short. It was a radical decision, but it was a life or death decision. And it meant cutting off something that was going to lead to his death. Is there something that you need to cut off today? Is there something that you need God to work in your heart, in your life, in your decision-making, in your lifestyle, in your health? Is there something you need to cut off? I believe that God can give you a victory through that. And I want to pray with you and ask God for that blessing. Father in heaven, thank you for this a message of help. We see that you want us to live longer, happier, healthy lives. Tired of seeing the devil have victory over our choices. God, may you help us to make choices that honor you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a question on today's presentation, shoot us a question. Leave it in the comments below. Go to BeholdTheSavior.com and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you and God bless.